Welcome everyone and thank you for being here for the third in our ASA Pet Food Pro chat series. Um, this is brought to you by Pet Food Forum 2021 and the editors of Pet Food Industry, the magazine and digital content provider with decades in providing the market with pet food expertise. I'm Debbie Phillips Donaldson, Editor-in-Chief of Pet Food Industry and Pet Food Forum. ASA Pet Food Pro is a great op opportunity to reach out to an industry expert ask the questions that are most on your mind, or just listen to your peers while gathering details to help you and your company provide quality pet food and treats. Today's chat about novel proteins in pet food is generously supported by OVA Innovations. Thanks very much to them. And to provide more information and introduce our expert, please welcome David Reddick, CEO of OVA Innovations. Dave, welcome. Hey, thank you, Debbie. Well, yeah, I could tell you about Ova Innovations. I've been kind of in the egg business all my life, and we are doing some really cool things with, with proteins and fats from eggs. But just really briefly, I know we're here to, to listen to Kelly and, and interact, but uh, I'll tell you, my current dog is named Bono, and so that might tell you a little bit about my musical Sorry, Dave, I accidentally muted you. I'm very sorry. <laughs> there you go. Now he's back. Hey, Debbie, am I back up? Yes, you are. I'm very sorry about that, folks. <laughs> oh, no problem. Well, I hope I won't repeat myself, but uh, I can tell you about Ova Innovations. I, I've been in the egg business kind of since I was knee high, but um, we're doing some really cool things with, with fats and proteins, but we're here to, to, to talk to and listen to Kelly on novel proteins, Dr. Kelly Swanson. And so, but just really briefly, um, my present dog is named Bono, um, which tells you a little bit about my, my musical interests. But when we uh, got our two children, my son was deathly scared of dogs and my dog is a Weimaraner. And, and so my son would, Bogdan would climb up on the back of a couch and run away. And, and today he, uh, he uh, it's his, Bono is his best friend, and uh, we call him a therapy dog, and and uh, and uh, he just Bono just velcros up to Bogdan and, and sleeps with them. So that's you know we all know the power of companion animals, but I just wanted to share that and and with that, turn it over to our expert today, Dr. Kelly Swanson from the University of Illinois Champaign Urbana. So Kelly, please take us away. All right, uh, thank you very much, Dave. I, I guess Debbie, you um, I know you're. You're kind of organizing this and kind of running the show. So I'll see, um, I'm not sure if you yep. just want to go right into questions or how you want to. Yes, we're going to start with questions. We're actually going to start with a question that was just submitted beforehand. Um, so thank you to everyone who did so. We have quite a few. We probably won't have time to address them all, unfortunately, but we'll try to cover as many as we can. Um, we also uh, invite anyone on the call to submit a uh, chat through uh, a question through the chat box. Um, I do have you all muted just so we um, can all get the most out of this, but if you can, you know, want to submit a questions, please use the, use the chat box and we will get to as many as we can. So we're going to start with talking about um, some of the uh, nutritional considerations of, of pet food proteins and testing and how to do that. Um, so let's start off. Kelly, um, where's my question? What are the nutritional constraints on using some of the most popular novel protein ingredient choices, um, are there nutritional, functional, or formulation limits on their use? That's a that's a kind of a that's a, a question with many answers potentially. <laughs> but so I'm just going to kind of touch the the top. Um, I think the the main areas first. Of course, there's a lot of functional properties. Of whether you know when you think about processing the food and what texture and functions that has in binding and things like that. But as a nutritionist, I you know you really I, I, all st I always start with the chemical analysis, what nutrients does it contain? So, you know, typically we look at, of course, the amino acid profile, look at the protein quality. So people think about digestibility a lot, and that's a very important, but you really need to look at the protein quality, which is really reflects the amino acid profile and relating that, that profile to the needs of the animal. And so that's where I start typically is chemically analyzing the protein and how much, how much protein is there and then what is the profile of the protein. Of course, we can't forget if there's fats, if there's minerals, you know, especially calcium and phosphorus, if there's bone in there, um, other things, you know, from that perspective. Um, and then, of course, it, marketability, the, the palatability to the pet, you know, the, the owner and the pet have to uh, you know, agree that this is a protein we want in the food as well. But I usually stay out of that realm. I stay on, on, the, on the nutrition side and kind of evaluate that way, uh, chemically analyzing it and then seeing, 
a lot of our studies are looking at the digestibility side of it. So um, again, processing, if processing is involved, uh, you know, with the ingredient, you know, what does that do to it as well? So um, that's, that's some of the main things I, I usually consider. Okay. Um, are there any specific markers that you look to investigate the impact of novel in ingredients on animal health? Um, I guess from, you know, not really markers necessarily. Uh, I know in our assessment, we're, we are often looking at, especially these novel proteins, again, how do they, how do they match to the needs of the dog and the cat in particular with, with you know, thinking about dogs and cats here, but some of the, the testing uh, methods, um, looking at how digestible it is, as well as the scoring, there are different scoring systems. So you can kind of look at the amino acid profile and then the digestibility to calculate you know, the needs and what, what limiting amino acid is there. So that's what I typically uh, stick with there. If you get into the health side of it, it really probably depends on what aspect of health you're, you're talking about. You know, that, um, you know, a lot of questions we received, whether it's on allergy or chronic kidney disease or, or something like that, you'd have to kind of kind of specify that. Um, I think in all of pet nutrition, um, you know, with the non-invasive aspect that we're, that we're dealing with now on the research side, um, having novel biomarkers or important biomarkers of health is a, is a key area I think that we still need more information on. And so hopefully uh, with the advent of, you know, and in, in kind of adoption of some of these new technologies, um, where metabolomics and genomics and things like that, we can maybe identify some biomarkers, but there's not a lot there, you know, just from a, um, I think we can kind of lean on the traditional methods, if you will, to look at, you know, what is protein quality? How digestible is it? Um, on, when I say digestibility, the one thing that is there is a key difference, you know, oftentimes we're looking at fecal samples where they're not really that accurate. So you know, in, the, in the past, not that, not that long ago, we had ileal cannulated uh, dogs and um, to look at what is digested by the animal. And so once these proteins, once everything gets into the colon, then the microbes kind of have their shot at it. And so that can kind of skew our view at sometimes of these proteins. So um, because there's really no ileal cannulated dogs anymore, we use susectomized roosters, and that's a model we've looked at quite a bit to look at individual ingredients or whole pet foods to see what, what would the animal get in terms of amino acid absorption um, you know, from those diets. And so it, oftentimes we, we, we um, do that along with a dog and a cat study to, you know, to, to really test out the food, but using some of those animal models are pretty important as well. Okay, um, and you mentioned uh, hypoallergenic or you know, allergenicity um, we had a few questions about that. One, one that just came in um, is referring to pet prescription, pet prescription diets that are tended to be hypoallergenic. Um, has much been looked at as far as cross-reactivity between proteins? I, I'd probably say yes and no. I guess um, we know that that occurs. So if you're, you know, uh, people are, if you're allergic to peanuts, there might be other nuts that you're also allergic to because that protein is similar enough. And, you know, I think it, the same thing would be if you have, you're allergic to beef, well, dairy, uh, you know, any dairy product that's still coming from the cow might also trigger that immune response. And so um, I think there's some data out there on that. And so we certainly know that occurs. I'm not sure if, uh, or at least maybe I just, I don't know <laughs> that there are data that say, you know, if you're allergic to this protein, you'd also likely be allergic to another protein, you know? So I'm not sure how much of that is out there, but a lot of it comes down to, you know, the origin of that protein and the similarity of, of those of those proteins really and what kind of initiated that immune response and if it's similar enough that the immune system is probably going to you know react to a, a very similar protein in the same way and so that would be um, you know a problem there the one I guess maybe an exception to that uh, although I'm not sure you'd still want to do this but you have if you have hydrolyzed proteins where you can reduce the size of those proteins under, you know, typically the kind of a level is 10,000 Daltons. And some will argue maybe it's a little bit lower than that um, in some of the diets, but you get to a different level, you can kind of, these proteins can kind of fly underneath the radar of the immune system. And so you maybe could bypass some of that, those issues with cross-reactivity, but that um, then you'd be having to be hydrolyzing those proteins. And so there are commercial foods with, with those proteins as well. Seems like a lot of this still hinges on um, more research being needed, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that never ends. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always more. It seems that as, as we think we know more, we, we, we stir up more, more questions and then we're, you know, every other questions to answer. So that's exactly right. Well, you mentioned uh, metalobomics and nutrigenomics, um, and there's been a few questions about that. One that just came in is, um, 
has, has there been any research or has your research in nutrigenomics shown that offering a variety of proteins and ingredients is beneficial versus, you know, offering a repetitive food? You know, we have, that's something we haven't tested. I think it's in the area of allergy and especially, I think there, there's always that thought that, you know, as, as a young growing puppy and a kitten, should you expose them to many proteins? And it's, it's almost like, you know, in the first couple of days, first few weeks of life, our, our, our gut has, a, has to develop a tolerance. So the, the, the gut, the, the, immune, the gut immune system kind of has to learn what, what is safe, what is you know, a potential pathogen or a, a problem. And so that, that, that kind of that tolerance and education, if you will, of, of the gut and the gut immune system uh, occurs. Um, and some people will say, you know, you should feed one, just one protein and, you know, for, for life or for, you know, and others say, just no, give them, give them everything else. And I'm not sure the, I think the jury's still probably out on that. It's, it's, there's so many complicating factors and I'm not sure there's enough biological variability and just exposures. I'm not sure if there is really one answer, you know, one right answer to that. Um, certainly if you have an animal that, be, you know, be, develops an allergy or something, then you certainly would have to be aware of that. And, that's where you get to more of the single protein diets or the like, maybe not a, a elimination diet, but more of the, the clean label, if you will. I guess there's different <laughs> definitions of what a clean label means, but you know, a, a single protein source, you know, one of the, or, or you know, more limited protein sources there. Um, but but I think it, once you develop an animal can develop that condition, yes. But I, I'm not sure there's much evidence of it, um, you know, before that time, but. Okay. And you mentioned, um, you just mentioned, cons you know, uh, clean label, for example, someone asked, uh, in regard to hydrolyzed proteins, are those accepted by consumers, you know, in a market that seems to be driven more and more by the fresh food trend? I, th I think they are. I, I, it's interesting that you can get really, really creative and way more creativity than I, <laughs> than I possess. But when you look at the over-the-counter diets, it's, you know, there's a million different ways to develop the foods. When you get over to the therapeutic side, I think owners and pet parents still might have their, their, their likes and their dislikes, but I think some of that takes a backseat to the health of the pet. And so I think some of that, um, you know, that, that critical judgment of certain ingredients maybe goes, goes away to, to some extent, you know, if the animal gets better, if there's, you know, then, then I think that that's the main goal, I think. And so some of that, I think, goes away a little bit, although um, I'm sure there's still, you know, there are certain uh, veterinarians that have told me that there are certain clientele that then they, they, they want to feed a homemade diet or they want to go completely away from commercial foods just because they don't think, you know, what, what is out there kind of addresses their need. But I think in general, I think, um, I, I think they're, they're viewed fairly well, although I, I don't do marketing research or anything like that. So um, I think at, at least that nutritionally, um, they're, they're fine. Um, Again, the, the devil's in the details there of what, where, what's the origin, what's the source, to what level is it being hydrolyzed. You know, there's a lot of things there of, of you can't just say really with any ingredient that, oh, it's, it's, it's perfectly great or, or it's horrible. There, there's very, unless there's a safety concern somewhere, you know, most of the ingredients that we have in, in the industry are, are fine to use. It's just what inclusion level, how are you using it? How is it processed? You know, the sourcing, is it consistent? You know, there's all these things you have to kind of check the boxes on to make sure it's a safe and consistent source for the pets. But um, very few extremes of it's perfect or it's, or it's uh, you know, completely bad. You know, so it's, it's very few things are black and white. It's, it's, there's a lot of gray area here, so. Sure, and related to, um, to that and to, and to research, uh, this is, I think, from a fellow researcher. Um, Everyone's demanding long-term studies after the DCM saga, but you know what? How do you outline the body of evidence for screening specific ingredients, and which organ systems would you target? Yeah, I think there's a process, and certainly you have to work within. Uh, I'm not an expert on the regulatory side, but I've served on several grass panels, and I've conducted research that are going towards the grass panel. So I know a little bit of, about that. But certainly, you need to know uh, and, and talk to the FDA or other you know, regulators on what is needed, number one. So you have an, an ingredient that's allowable. And so a lot of that, you know, those guidelines that FDA puts out there will kind of guide you through the process, what type of study should be done. Not that those guidelines couldn't be adapted, you know, especially on the, when you talk about biomarkers or long-term studies, I think there's a lot of discussion there that I'm not sure I have a great answer 
to uh, you know that. But I think you you have to initially start with with the big picture before you get into some really complicated study. You want to know what you have chemically. What what do you have? What's the you know what's the product that you're you're dealing with? Are there any safety risks? You know up front. Uh, when you start, and you can do a lot of that in the lab, or just go to the library, and you can save yourself a lot of time and money by just researching a little bit or hiring a consultant that can do that. Um, but really up front, I, we often will start with just a general GI tolerance digestibility test that are pretty sh you know, short-term tests. It can be just a matter of a few weeks, really, if you want to do the, kind of the bare minimum to see, will they eat the food at whatever inclusion level that you're, you know, really any ingredient, but if you're thinking about protein, um, how digestible is this ingredient going to be? Uh, stool quality, you know, at, at whatever inclusion level, is this still fine? And um, ideally, you would do some kind of dose response. You know where you know, the market might tell you at a given a certain price point of, of what your cap is, but you could think biologically, nutritionally, where, where could you go? And oftentimes those two factors, those two factors alone will kind of tell you, well, you'd never include this in a diet more than 10% or more than 15% or, you know, I know we had a few questions on that too. What inclusion level would you use? It really depends on what, you know, what the profile is of the product. And then the market will probably dictate to how much can be in the, in the food. It uh, depends on what segment of the market you're in, but um, you know, in the long-term testing, that, that's a tricky one. At, um, you'd still, again, when you, you're, you're uh, doing some of these studies for to try to get graph status or trying to get into you know, an AFCO definition, um, you typically, it's, it's a six-month study, and I think it it's, um, you know, gives you a little bit more time. It has to be the sole source of ingredients, and I think our sole source of food, and I think most people know what, what those guidelines are. I think it's what we're measuring probably is what can be developed. And I, I, I think I know who asked the question. So that person <laughs> certainly, I think, has been thinking about this as well as are there biomarkers we can say after a month, after two months, after six months, that will give you some more information than just a CBC and, and a, you know, a serum chemistry profile, you know, and, and they didn't change body weight. You know, that's, that's kind of the bare minimum. It doesn't really tell you too much. And unfortunately, if you're marginally deficient in something, sometimes it, you can go beyond that six months and before you really see something drastic. And so I think that's where maybe they're getting at uh, that I hopefully um, with some of the research coming up, we can identify some of those biomarkers, but it, it probably depends on what you're looking at as well of, you know, if you're testing a protein source and you're looking at proteins, it might be something different than if it's truly, you know, a safety concern with uh, some other contaminant or, or something else like that, you know, with when you when you look through, it's is it toxic? Is it a mutagen? You know, all these other things. Uh, when it comes to most of our protein sources, that's not what we're talking about. It's it's more of a nutritional factor there that um, might might you know you'd be looking at some maybe some metabolites or something like that. But um, other than saying that, I'm not sure if I have a great answer. But I, I need to keep discussing uh, some of these questions with yeah some of the other people, especially on the research side, that can get use some of these molecular techniques and, and things going forward. Okay, well, you mentioned protein sources. We've had a lot of questions about specific kinds of novel proteins, especially insects. Um, we had a lot of questions coming on beforehand and, and some, a lot of your posts now. Um, thank you to Dr. Guido Bosch. Uh, he's a leading in, uh, researcher and insect researcher at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And he posted a link in the chat box for folks um, with a review of insect, research, insect as protein sources. Um, but to you, Kelly, um, there's so many questions. I'm not sure where to start, but it, you know, one interesting question is, you know, just from your research, what is your opinion on on insect protein, and what do you think the future is? And yeah, I think too, a bit broad, but sure. No, that's you know, I don't, I don't know. Again, on the on the production and marketing side necessarily, but nutritionally, we have done some research on site, and you know. Guido wrote a review and he, we collaborated a little bit, but it was mainly him. And he's, that's why he's first author on that. But we have a review that it's, um, I think it'll be in the final, in its final form um, very soon with page numbers soon, but it's online. And if you sent the link, then you can, you can get access to it. And we basically reviewed kind of what's out there right now. And so a lot of it was started with either in vitro digestion or maybe some rooster studies, again, looking at the digest digestibility composition analysis. That's again, where you start. And so uh, it really depends on the type of insect you're talking about and whether all the way from production to composition. But there, there, there's a lot of interesting sources out there that are high, high quality protein. Um, interesting, some of them also have very interesting fat profiles. And so some of the fatty acid profiles you, you would get from those, there's uh, often many of these insects, there is a protein meal, there is an oil portion, but if you have the whole insect, you can also, then you get, you get everything there. So, um, 
those are very interesting. The, again, the details really depend on how the animal, how the insect have been, has been raised, what light, you know, what age at which it's been harvested. And so that will dictate, especially with some of these people, there, there was a question about concerns about uh, the exoskeleton. So you have a lot of chitin or you have, you have chitin, not a lot of chitin. Usually they're harvested before that composition or that the chitin concentration gets too high. Um, but one area that hasn't been well studied yet, but it's an, it's an interesting area, is that chitin can serve as a fiber in the diet as well. So really you have the protein source, you have you know, interesting fatty acid sources there as well, but the, you, you have a little bit of uh, chitin there that will serve as fiber. And so what hasn't been studied is how fermentable is that, you know, and, and, and then again, you'd have to think about the consistency there is uh, if in a given system and in a uh, one manufacturer, their product hopefully be fairly consistent. What's not really known, and this is what the industry will have to kind of adapt to and formulators will have to adapt to, you have different competitors. If they're harvesting them, treating them differently, of course, the, the, the amino acid profile or the protein content, the fat content, the chitin content is all gonna be different. So we can't really lump all of them together. And when you, when you look at grass panels and their approvals, your know, crickets are on there. You have crickets, you have black soldier fly. Those are the two kind of leading the charge. We have other mealworms and other things coming on their heels. And so I think there's a lot of, uh, based on the sustainability and, and just, I think more acceptability, um, not only on the livestock side, but on the pet side, I think it's an area that certainly in the next you know, decade or something, we're gonna see a lot of these things emerging and kind of coming into the market. So um, it's quite exciting and very interesting actually that, um, you know, again, all the, the various insects that are out there and then um, some that have kind of, you know, again, they're, they're kind of leading the charge, but the model is there that you have to do the testing, you have to know what you're dealing with, uh, but there's a lot of benefits there, I think, and a lot of applications, um, whether it's complete foods or treats or, or whatever we, we might have. So um, yeah, it's an exciting area. Indeed, indeed. It'll be interesting to see um, first if, you know, how the consumer acceptance level as more of these become approved and used. And then also, um, obviously, if, once they've been out on the market for a place for a while, some long-term research on their, their benefits. Um, mm -hmm. So addressing another kind of uh, novel protein, um, since we have a, a, a egg protein supplier on the call, what, what about egg protein in pet food? Yeah, when, when, when we, we heard, you know, who, who the sponsor was and what questions might be there, I thought, well, that, that's probably easy questions because the, the way I view things, uh, egg is usually the, the top of the chart and you get down to, from, from egg, you get to, to fresh proteins, you get to, you know, animal protein meals, and then you get down to the plant ingredients, you know, you typically is how, how you are and the insects are kind of in that area as well, but egg is kind of at the top of the heap there. So um, egg protein is, is, you know, well, about a, even if you're trying to manufacture a protein quality, I mean, egg protein is there to grow it, grow an animal, right? It's there to develop a chicken ultimately. So it, it has a, it's a complete protein, and um, as long as I would I would say as long as it's processed correctly, it, it's a, it's a great protein. So Dave might want to chime in here as well, but it, that's an easy question from my from a nutrition perspective. <clears throat> No, I, I really don't have much to add. Kelly's the expert, but it, it uh, you know, we in my we always think of it as as layperson as the as the gold standard for for um, balanced amino acids and digestibility. And Kelly, you may redirect that with your background, but that's uh, that for me is kind of as simple as it gets. Is there um, are either of you aware of any consumer backlash or concern? You know, there's for a while now there's been this big uh, trend in. The pet food industry among, among consumers and well, among everyone really for you know meat first and you know my animal has to be fed as it was as if it would eat in the wild which is probably based partially on myth anyway but um, at least with dogs but I mean is there any consumer acceptance issues because of that meat first philosophy that a lot of people have? You know, I'll just chime in. You know, we're seeing, uh, I, I think, growth, and obviously, there's just more and more diversification in the marketplace. So I, I don't know that that you know the diversification that you're talking about is is really um, um, altering kind of the trajectory of eggs in, in diet, at least certain diets. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I would I would hope that you know marketing can do certain things and kind of almost demonize certain ingredients. I would I, I would think the nutrition nutrition community would kind of push back on that one pretty hard if, if people start targeting eggs. You can't, you, you can't get much, you, can, you really can't get any better than eggs. So, um, and, and you know, the fresh proteins where, where you have 
egg, the other thing too is not not that you couldn't partition parts of the egg out, I suppose, and it, you know, if you had the egg versus the yolk and things like that. But the one thing with fresh proteins, you know, animal proteins, I say, you know, that that's at you know, once you go from egg down, kind of down the slope of protein quality, the fresh proteins are are there. But it really does depend on what are you starting with. Is this is this skeletal muscle, which I think people think about skeletal muscle, but it, we we know for a fact a lot of our ingredients. It, it might, it, whether it's all the way from trimmings, if it's a, it's a, a mixture of organ meats and muscle, or, you know, what is there? It really depends, the quality depends on digestibility is going to depend on, you know, how much uh, cartilage is there and, and, you know, high quality cuts are there. So that can vary quite a bit within, within that category. And then you go downhill, you know, again, <clears throat> to the, to the meals. And again, if they're, they're slightly processed um, versus heavily processed, again, the what you started with might have been the same, but what you end up with and what gets into the food is, is very different, you know, so processing is a key part there. But yeah, when it comes to egg, unless you were, you know, someone was to over just over process it, that's really the only way you could kind of ruin egg protein, I think. So, but I, I would hope from a marketing side, you know, it, it um, I, I do think, and I know we don't want to go on a, down the DCM road, but I, but one point I, I think I want to make, there's a silver lining to, to that, I'll, I'll say, situation. <laughs> because uh, I don't want to go down there. But also this last year in the pandemic, I think um, D the DCM issue started it within companies. <clears throat> but I think everyone at companies, but also consumers are really starting to think about what am I feeding our, our, my pet? And they, a lot of the formulas, for better or worse, have, people have been re-evaluating their formulas. And I think it really got important when it came to protein. Th there's other things that maybe haven't changed so much, but I think the ingredient, and it was the protein-based ingredients that really maybe some of those were, some some of the, formulas that were out there were maybe a little bit too extreme. And so people have kind of reined them in a little bit and kind of reconsidered um, the ingredients they're using, you know, from A to Z kind of in some of these companies, their process um, going on and what are we, what's in the bag, what's in the package, um, what's in the can, whichever format you have, um, what are we giving the pet? So I think that's a silver lining to this. And I've served on several advisory boards and some of these topics keep coming up, but the good thing is um, people are, I think, looking at that a little bit, a little bit closer. What are we feeding? What, what are our formulas there to do? And are they doing that? And so I think that's a, that's a good thing. So I would hope, um, I know we always need marketing, but there, there would be, you know, I, I think the nutrition side is, is kind of raised up a little bit recently of saying, Hey, we, we, it just can't be marketing. We have to, we have to make sure these diets provide what we say we're providing. So. Right. Right. Well, um, yeah, we, the, the point of today's discussion is not DCM, so we won't get into that, but just um, that did spur a movement more back to grains and also um, looking at different sources. And, and so in terms of, of different protein sources, um, from what you described as the, the quality level, this quality pyramid of whatever of, uh, of different proteins, I mean, I, I'm assuming that vegetable proteins are further down that, but they are becoming more popular. And we have a fair, a few amount of, a fair amount of questions about plant-based proteins. Um, can you speak to that category in general? And then uh, we'll maybe address a, a specific question or two. Sure. And before I, before I go too far, it doesn't mean we can't feed vegetable-based proteins either. You know, we've been talking, I think, a lot about you, <clears throat> especially with if you have limited ingredient diets, you might need a, a, a complete protein on its own. But we know nutritionally, at the end, you need a complete and balanced diet. So you can take a couple of incomplete proteins, mix them together. The, the classic example is rice and beans, or you know, there's other examples as well, but they might have each deficiencies on their own, but you can combine them together and you have a complementary protein source. And so there's a lot of um, you know, reasons why, but certainly there are some uh, plant-based proteins as well. We've had, you know, corn, whether it's corn gluten meal or more on the legume side, traditionally soybean meal in the past, but that legume area has gone beyond soybean meal. And, and if you just say soybean meal, some might say, well, what, what, what kind, how has it been processed? So there's different variations of, the, of just in soybeans, but um, you, you know, when do, whether you're talking about chickpeas and the, the beans and lentils, there's a lot of, been, been a lot of uh, work in that area and somewhat controversy in that area. Again, if you're formulating the diets correctly, all of these ingredients are fine. It's just how you use them in combination. So you always have to come back to your formula in your ingredient database, you know, your formula is only as good as your ingredient database tells you, you know, the formula is. And so you have to really know what you're working with there. But um, there are others though too, that not in the US quite as much, but in Europe, uh, you know, potato, there's isolated potato protein and maybe in, even in Canada, I believe as well, uh, that, that is making its way and becoming a little bit more popular. But there's always been, you know, 
years ago, soy protein isolates concentrates, and now some of the other grains even um, have other, you know, specific concentrates and, and isolates. And so, um, again, it comes down to how much of the protein can be provided and then what amino acid profile is there. But certainly, um, you know, beyond that as well, you know, I guess we're, it's not plant necessarily, but you get into yeast and microalgae, there's other protein sources right. as well that have, um, you, for every single source, you have to come back to what is it providing, you know, what, what there from a nutrient perspective. It, again, we focus primarily on the amino acid profile, but you have to think about other potential, you know, enzyme inhibitors on the plant side. There are, there are some things to think about, maybe some other challenges, you know, some of the initial legumes, you have a lot of oligosaccharides that come with it. There might, there's a, a little bit of extra dietary fiber. That's fine as long as you know how much is there. So I was talking to a company earlier this week on, you know, a lot of those oligosaccharides, they won't measure as fiber. So you won't see them unless you're trying to look for them because they're soluble and they'll, they'll go through the assay. So you have to at least consider those um, so you don't have any you know, stool quality issues and, uh, or, or just assuming you just can't formulate to crude protein. You need to know you're meeting all the amino acid uh, requirements. And really that's when you get down to it too. On the nutrition side, we have a lot of discussions here on campus of you really, there is no protein requirement. It's on the package, but really you have an amino acid, re amino acid requirements and nitrogen requirement. We talk about crude protein a lot, but that really doesn't mean too much if the if the protein's not balanced, you know, with, with the different amino acids. So you have to keep that in mind all the time. So, um, but yeah, there's really I don't cross anything off the list. You can you can use almost all of these protein sources. It's just how you use them. The inclusion level might be different, and then what other complementary source comes with it is, is certainly important. But at the end of the day, if you have good data on what you're you're de dealing with, the formulators can figure it out. You know, they'll. Um, and they have to might work with the, the, the marketing folks and the sales and marketing uh, side of the company, but you can make all of them work. It's just, it depends on how, you, how you're using them. Okay, great, thank you. Um, ha have you done any research or are you aware of any um, difference in nutrigenomic response um, from, from plant proteins versus uh, meat-based proteins? Not really, I'll, I'll say not really. I can't say much about it, but we, we have an, a study that recently finished where we are going to look a little bit at some gene expression just in the blood so there was no biopsies or anything taken but in the blood to look at some gene expression profiles and that one was looking at different protein sources um, but that could be a, an interesting area I think that um, again with some of these uh, techniques we have now we might be able to measure things without being you know doing anything harmful to the animal there might be slight changes metabolically or, or in a, in a, in a genomic response, like a gene expression response, uh, then we might be able to detect differences there uh, metabolically. And, and potentially, again, if there's longer term studies done uh, health from a health perspective. And so, um, so I say, I don't think there's much done out there. there. There certainly is a lot of nutrigenomic work out there. And some of the, I don't want to say any names, but there have been a couple of companies that have done a lot of work on the nutrigenomic, nutrigenomic side to develop not only over-the-counter diets, but aging diets, some of the therapeutic formulas, they use nutrigenomics as, as a, you know, as a tool to, to, to develop those diets, in addition to, you know, the foundation nutrition uh, principles. So um, that, that's, that's, it is an area I think could be, could be used in the future. So we hopefully understand a little bit more. Um, I'm talking a lot about amino acid profiles and digestibility, but there's probably more to it than that. You, you know, digestibility just tells you what, what was absorbed and what was digested and what was excreted, sorry. Um, but we, often don't get into metabolism. That's where some of these uh, issues are, met they're metabolism issues. And so we, that's where you'd have to get into other, other markers, I think, to look at metabolically, how are they responding? And so it's, it goes beyond just digestibility, of course. Right, right. Um, we, have, we had a few questions about, you know, more exotic meat sources. So kangaroo, ostrich, alligator, um, have you done much research in those or do you have any other insights on particular sources like that? We haven't done much research. We, we did have one study. It was, it was a susceptimized rooster study where we looked at uh, amino acid digestibility of a few as exotic as we got, but, uh, but we did have alligator meal in there. Uh, we, so we had alligator, we had some calamari meal. And so those were very <laughs> kind of interesting uh, to feed. We had some, I think, duck and lamb meal and venison meal in, in there as well. So we've done some of those studies. Uh, early on, we also working, it was more of a trying to mimic and model zoo animals. So zoo, big cats and zoos are fed a lot of horse meat. 
But when okay. the horse slaughter ban came in, then we looked at bison, we looked at elk, uh, some other alternatives because at the, at the time the zoos were having trouble getting horse meat. Um, so in the, at least in the United States, most people don't, we don't, we're not consuming horses. I know in other parts of the world people are, but, um, but in the zoos at that time, they were really concerned. There was a lot of, I think, dogma and just kind of, this is what we've always fed. What are we going to feed these cats? And so we did do some of that feeding. And, you know, again, it kind of comes down to what you, your, your, um, what you start with. But some of them, um, I, I would say on some of the exotic, but, but really it, it applies to all, even our more domesticated species. You really want to know how consistent is the product. Again, how much protein is there, fat and ash. If bone is there or not, you can have really high ash content with some of these uh, proteins. So you just want to know what you have and what you're dealing with. I think if you have a, you know, it's not too much ash and, and, and too much, you'd have to think again about how much um, connective tissue there is, cartilage is there, because the protein quality will suffer. But we've seen in some of them, um, in one is lamb meal, we've, we've tested a couple times that the digestibility is not quite as high. So that just, and that tends to be for whatever reason it is. And some of it could be just the high ash content there where, um, but what, what, what we tested, whether it's alligator, calamari, you know, digestibility wise and amino acid profile, they're all unique, but they all tested fairly well. So again, I think it comes down to, we haven't done anything with, with in our lab anyway, with kangaroo or ostrich or, you know, any other, anything you can, you can raise or catch or, you know, legally put into a pet food. <laughs> Nutria. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it, it really, I think I always kind of come back to those, those basic principles of what, what you have. And, um, and again, I don't know anything on the consistency either. That would be something that with a lot of the animal sources, that is one thing you have to at least think about. Maybe not to be concerned about. You have to be have, you know, some tight specs on your, your, your protein content, your fat and ash, because they can really vary quite, quite a bit over time. And so you want to make sure, especially if you're uh, a lot of those sources are a, are a byproduct or a secondary product, of course. So you just want to make sure the, the, the raw sources and ingredients kind of parts of the animal coming into that equation are consistent over time or else you're going to have, you know, the formulator is going to drive themselves crazy or you're, or you're not going to meet the specs on the label because your, 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 your nutrients are fluctuating too much, you know, so you have to be, you have to be careful from that side. But um, if you have, you know, things where it's consistent, I think those sources would be, would be fine to use. It's just, I think a little bit more uh, research needs to be done, but at, at minimum, you know, you need to know what, what the nutrient profile looks like on, on those, um, and, and put it into your software. And ensure a steady supply, which, um, you know, mm -hmm. we've had a few comments mentioning that for egg protein, for example, it's, you know, not as readily available. Um, and some of these more exotic meats, probably the same situation, depending on where you are. That, that's one thing to, you hit on a very good thing. So the consistency, but then availability and, and availability around, you know, are there seasons, you know, of, of it's very, uh, you know, around Thanksgiving in the U.S., you'll see, you know, more, some, some companies will spin out a turkey, you know, where it's kind of seasonal, where for a couple months, maybe there's more turkey byproduct. I know we eat a lot of turkey anyway in this country, but uh, so it maybe is not due to supply, but certainly it, it's maybe due to consumers saying, oh, I, you know, I'm going to treat my, my dog to a, you know, or, or cat to a turkey dinner or something like that. So, um, but yeah, availability and consistency over, over the, over the year uh, is, is pretty important. So. Okay, uh, you, we touched a little bit on uh, marine sources. Uh, someone commented that he lives in an area with underutilized seafood. So for example, crabs and shrimp heads that end up being dumped. Um, can something like that, or are you aware of something like that being utilized and or researched? Yeah, they definitely can be used. And you know, especially if it's something where um, I always say, people kind of get on byproducts, but I'm like, if, if you don't feed it to livestock or animals, or I mean, you could use it maybe for fertilizer, but what are you going to do with it? If, if it's being a waste, hopefully we can, re you know, I know we had one question about upcycling and the pet food industry for, I mean, since its foundation has been kind of using upcycling and using things that other people viewed as not, you know, it's not human food. And again, in the U S we eat, we don't eat certain things that are consumed in other parts of the world. So we have to think about it that way, but yeah, if something's being dumped, um, you know, the, there are certainly, when you get to the marine side, just like any other animal, it'd be, you know, what, what part are you talking about? You know, that if it's a certain you know, a, a byproduct, uh, you'd have to test, you know, what is the composition there? And again, from a variability perspective, what are you dealing with? But certainly I think that's an area that's probably untapped as well, that you, you see certain fish species that are, uh, whether it's a byproduct from the human industry or it's just raised for, you know, whether it's aquaculture or pet food, it, it's out there, but 
um, th there's probably untapped sources of, uh, you know, proteins uh, that are that are not being used in, in certain areas. And so if you could, I guess the, the tricky thing there, I'm guessing it too, especially if it, depending on where it is, is can you stabilize that and, and, and you know, can you freeze it or, or something so it's not going, you know, going rancid or something with those types of sources that goes for any protein source really or any any ingredient source but um there are some challenges there if you're out in in a body of water and you can't get to land or you know to you know kind of address the stability issues there that could be a problem but if you can address that and, and kind of preserve the, the the raw material you know then then i think you're you have something to deal with there but um there, there was a study back in, uh, actually with ileal cannulated dogs, I believe with different fish byproducts years ago in the Fahey lab. And this is about 15 years ago. I remember the different composition of different types of fish, but also different parts and different kind of um, streams, if you will, byproduct streams of what the composition is from those products. And so um, definitely that's where I would start, but but certainly a little bit of, um, you know, you have to is it still palatable? What inclusion levels you can do? Kind of come back to the same principles, but yeah, that's um, another area that could be, that hasn't been studied a lot, but certainly um, it is a great area of, of kind of using some of those, those resources. Okay. Um, yeah, let's, we'll return to the whole upcycling sustainability aspects, but let's, one, one area that you mentioned and a couple people have asked about it are um, single cell protein sources, um, microalgae, um, you know, any, any particular comments on that or uh, on the, those areas? Yeah, I think the most, uh, you know, I don't know as much on microalgae and there's not a lot of work in pets in particular. I know there's some on the livestock side and, and showing kind of the benefits there. And with some of those uh, protein sources in particular, the microalgae, you're going to have an interesting fatty acid profile that comes along with some of that protein. So that could be an interesting side, you know, and have kind of a dual uh, use uh, ingredient there, but certainly on the yeast side, um, that's been studied for, for a long time, you know, whether it's for palatants, there are some yeast fermentation products that are actually probably fit the bill as a, as a postbiotic now, but there are some that are, are there for, for protein. And so, you know, yeast, um, you know, and I know there's different, if you just say yeast, it depends on what, what, what kind of yeast is it for brewing? Is it for, you know, is it specifically for livestock or pet food or for human consumption it really depends on what you're talking about there but um, usually a really good amino acid profile and you, you know a lot of rich in B vitamins and other nutrients as well so um, that's another area that I think is um, in my, my experience the most of the experience is on the yeast side but um, I think yeah microalgae is another whether it's from sustainability or again kind of a unique uh, nutrient profile that has some um, some potential there as well. Okay, well, let's talk about sustainability for a few minutes because we did get uh, received quite a few questions about that and the whole <laughs> upcycling. And yeah, I have always said that you know pet food needs to better tell its whole pet, pet its whole upcycling sustainability story because you know the industry has used byproducts for years and and they unfortunately became demonized in some some situations. But I mean, do you see that all changing? Do you see there being um, not only a move to more "Quote unquote upcycled ingredients, but also just the acceptance of them by companies and by consumers. Yeah, I think I think it probably. Um, I think people are getting more and more personalized, and so I, I think there's going to maybe be segments. I, I think, and it's probably already there. Where um, when you really talk about sustainability, you know, you have the environmental side, and that's probably the area that's easiest to prove, but you, what's kind of the, in the, you have the economics, so you have environment, the economics, and then the social side, and the social side is the one that for many consumers dictates, for some consumers, it's, it's the economics that I'm, I just refuse to pay over a certain level, or, or I can't, you know, I can't afford a certain food, so those are definitely real. Um, I think on the environmental side, you can, um, you know, there will be, again, I think always use of the, of the buy, you know, byproducts, or I often, after writing a, a sustainability paper, I often, because some terms have byproduct in it, I usually say secondary products because it is coming, you know, secondary to the human industry, to food industry typically is where they're coming from. But um, I'm pretty flexible for me, my own uh, and, and who, I, who I work with, who I've done research with. I've done everything from, again, looking at insect meals and, and, and secondary products all the way up to human grade foods. And so there are consumers in each segment of, of you know, and so I'm, I think you can make it work with any different any way 
Uh, but I think it, some consumers are going to want certain things. And if you can address what you know, really what they want, and some again at the human grade level, you can feed pets human grade foods. And so, um, but there's pros and cons with every with every food. And so, some you know, it's more of the social side I think dictating those those purchasing options in, in certain segments anyway. And so, I think the, the the byproducts will always be there. And I think some of these sustainability is driving some of these. So we're up kind of recycling or upcycling some of these that have, we've been using for years and years. Um, but then we, a, a big push for the insect and some of these other alternatives are, I think, on the sustainability side, or at least that's driving or pushing, it's part of that push, you know, to, to we need more. Um, as people consume animal, you know, animals for food, there's always going to be those secondary products. And so some people get pretty, especially I'm in an animal science department. So the, the, the beef and sheep guys get pretty worked up or, or women get pretty worked up about when you look at the carbon footprint, the water footprint. Because just physiologically, their reproductive cycle, their metabolic efficiency or maybe inefficiencies are, are not the same as a chicken or, or aquaculture. It's just, they're just different. Um, we have to, you know, you can't just look at every, one aspect of it. You have to think about, you know, there's a lot of those animals I said that with a higher footprint, sheep and anything that grazes grass. There are some areas of the world that that's the best thing. For, that's been the only thing you can do with that land is for grazing because you can't it's not, you know, central Illinois where you can plow the field and, you know, grow a lot of corn or and soybeans or whatever. So um, it really depends on the, the situation. So um, I think, yeah, there's always going to be that level of recycling. Even there's been some talk, I don't know how you get around this, but even, you know, people have thought, can we use, you know, unused food from the human, uh, you know, cafeterias and things like that and, and get into pet food. People already do that with, I think, with livestock feed. It, it gets a little bit tricky with pet food. Again, you know, how consistent would that be? Is it safe? You know, there's, if you've been in a cafeteria, there's all kinds of things that go into, into you know, some people are, are very careful how they might separate things out with the food waste and the, you know, the other products. Some people just dump the whole thing in there. So that, that would have many, that's kind of the extreme, I think, on, on recycling or upcycling. But there are a lot of, you know, secondary products, I think, that are being used and will continue to be used. Um, and so, Again, I, I'm not, I, my opinion is I, I really don't care. You can make a diet a million different ways, but I usually do, whether it's consulting or research, I try to deal, work with the sponsor or with the company. How, how can you best use your ingredients and in your, to fit your, you know, what is your marketing message? And again, I try to rein people in if they're, if they're over the line, I think I, I try to pull them back in and say, you know, it really, that's not true. You know, you, you can say this, but you can't say that, or you, you don't have data to say this. And so I think a lot of, Pet food companies are dealing with the same thing, that uh, nothing against the marketing. You, you will need to sell your food, of course, and it doesn't do any benefit if you're, you're not selling the product. But uh, you have to you know, kind of come back to the basics and see what do I have and, and what does your, um, what is your, uh, not that it has to be your mission statement of the company, but at some level it kind of is. What are you trying to produce? What are you trying to provide and, and why? And so if you have the backing for that and, it, and it's legitimate, I'm all for it. And so, um, again, you just have you have many different aspects of it and the companies are coming at it from different ways. And so even within the large companies, they have, they're up at the super premium and they're all the way down to what I'll say economy diets. And um, regardless of what I do, my parents still go, I think, still go to the, the grocery store and they pick what's on sale that week. And so I've, <laughs> and then that's fine. And, and so, but that, you know, I've educated them on certain things and there's nothing against the economy foods either, but, but that's the reality that people will buy what they want to buy. And so I, I guess my job is to try to make them fit. So they're all complete and balanced. They're safe. And I think that's what everyone's goal is. And so, um, but I think, yeah, I mean, you can have these other segments that are at a higher price point, but the, the byproducts will always be really important part of the industry as a whole, because there's, you know, if you look at the segment, the percentages, you know, the, that economy um, segment is, is really big. And so, and, and not that it has to be, you know, uh, that saying that, that those are the only diets that have byproducts or anything like that, but, um, and they meet the needs. I mean, pets are, are living healthy, long, long lives. And so I don't, um, you just have to be careful when you're formulating and know what you're, what you're working with there. So. Um, okay. You mentioned carbon footprints um, and we did have a question about, you know, are you aware of any uh, sources that measure like the CO2 factor of the different protein sources? I know that the Pet Sustainability Coalition has been doing some research with, um, Sorry, it's Iowa State or Iowa State, I believe. Um, are you aware of anything else? Any other sources for that? I, you know, I don't. I know some people have done um, looking at life cycle assessment, like the LCA, to, mm -hmm. to look at different things. Typically, it's you know people looking at humans and applying some of those values to pet, and that's where I think 
um, and I know a lot of companies are thinking about that, doing life cycle assessment and seeing these different sources and, you know, making decisions based on that. I mean, the reality of availability and cost, of course, dictate that too. But if you're going to try to be more sustainable from that perspective, um, you know, what calculations are out there? And that really varies quite a bit too. Carbon and water footprint. If you're growing corn here in central Illinois versus somewhere in Asia or South America, it, it's all different. So you have to kind of be regional there when you think about that. Um, transportation, you know, it, raising animals, are they, you know, are they grazing in a, in, a, in a pasture? Are they being raised in a feedlot? And there's a lot of um, myths in that area as well. But when you really kind of come down to it, there's many different ways of doing it. Unfortunately, I think the, the, the key limiter on, on the pet side is if you, some people will give the same value if you have meat and bone meal versus a, a sirloin steak. Clearly, we know although those are different products and it's not saying anything against meat and bone meal, but they're just different. They're coming from different cuts and you have the bone there, you know. Uh, but some people will give them the same carbon footprint because it comes from a cow. I guess I don't agree with that philosophy, if, especially on the pet side or livestock, you know, aquaculture. If we're using secondary products, that, that's really giving a credit, if you will, to the human food industry. Or, or it, you know, it has a different footprint in my mind uh, that if you have half the carcass of many of these animals, it's half the carcass is not going to human food production. It's going somewhere else. And so, you know, you know I think I, that doesn't deserve this, have the same footprint. And so... Um, I think that for the for the pet food, and I you could argue with livestock feed, um, that that's an argument that probably maybe will never go away. Of what what um, you know, do you give it half the footprint? Do you give it you know, you know, can you give a calculation there? But that LCA analysis or the LCA is is quite important. And, and again, the more work uh, that, that's that's done in that area, I think it'll be more useful as well. Then then companies can use things again to have more data to work with. Again, it has to be good high you know high quality data though to put in their, their calculations. These LCA calculations are not simple and, and usually you need someone that really can handle the big data and a mathematician to go through all these calculations. But um, when you start looking at the these footprints and the, the calculations that go into it, there's so many considerations as well. And even around the world, talking about water footprint, water footprint uh, shipping somewhere, you know, in, in central Illinois, we've had plenty of rain and we're, we typically we're not, we, we can have droughts, but it's very different than different than other areas of the world. People are talking about even water credits, shipping water credits around the world as well. You know, shipping fresh, you know, moisture-containing ingredients to one place and dry ingredients out. And so, you know, shipping water around the world. I never really thought about that until you get into some of these sustainability um, discussions, because I think greenhouse gas and carbon takes the, especially when you get into the politics, it's, it's all about greenhouse gas and that. But the water footprint's a big issue as well, and so shipping water around the world um, in the form of different ingredients can really have an impact. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a, that's another area that I, it's never gonna go away because we're trying to feed more people, you know, population keeps growing. Um, there's always, and I guess there'll always be the haves and the have nots, but it's in some areas of the world, it's really that, that divide is getting wider and wider. And so that'll, the sustainability side of it really, really hits home, I think more. And so, um, no, we need more people on the research side, and, and that's where it really takes collaboration as well. Um, once in a while, you'll see, and it gets a lot of press uh, on the human side typically, but some have tried on the pet side where they have really, I guess, bad assumptions, and they've used these poor assumptions in to make this model and then to generate data. But if you have bad data or poor assumptions going in, then your data are very inaccurate. And so sometimes then the message gets skewed quite a bit. And so there's a lot of... Um, uh, controversy kind of around the sustainability side with some of those calculations, I think as well. So you just have to, I think you need collaboration so you're, you're doing things as, as honest as, as you can be, I think, and, and as accurate as you can be. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's, we could probably have a whole session just on sustainability. I think, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, we will next, next month on, on packaging. Um, so uh, we've touched a little bit on processing considerations um, so maybe we can spend a few, the last, some of our last few minutes on that. One question that had come in was, um, how are some of the new proteins changing pet food texture requirements? Uh, current hydrocolloids used include carrageenan, locust bean gum, cassia gum, xanthan gum, etc. I mean, are those, you know, we talk a lot about interactions with ingredients during processing, especially, you know, are those being impacted by some of these newer sources? This will probably be a short response given the lack of knowledge in the area by me, but 
you know, some I'll, I'll say like Greg Aldridge or, or other people, and certainly people in the industry probably know better than better than that. But that other than to say, so I don't have a great answer here, but that is another thing that to really think about that you can develop a great formula on paper. Once you get into the pilot plant or the actual final facility, you really have to make sure that the the properties of the food aren't being you know affected negatively. And so, uh, but I do know there is some area, and I know Maria Godoy, one of my, my collaborators here at Illinois, she's working more on the on the processing side. And so she has worked at some of the alternative binders, I think. And so there is work being done in that area, whether it's for you know looking at texturized protein for canned diets, or or certainly it would affect. Uh, kibble food it would it would affect human grade food as well you know how um I've, I've worked with some people on the human grade side too that they have to adapt their their you know whether you're so some companies kind of cook their sous vide where it's kind of all together there are others that are taking their vegetables and, and they're processing them separately their, their protein uh, animal based proteins they're processing them separately and then putting them together as you would in your in your home you don't cook everything the same typically and so all of those properties, though, can really vary what you're starting with and how you're processing those. So, um, so, so I don't know the specifics on that area, but certainly it would be something that has to be thought about. It's not just, you know, Swanson said we have to do something, you know, do all these calculations on paper and then think everything's going to work. You really have to think about it. And that's where fiber, the, the, the property, the physical properties are, they are, is something sticky. Does it grab onto water? Does it flow well through this, you know, through the system you're using? Um, you really have to you know, test a lot of that out as well, excuse me, to make sure that what you have on paper adapts well and, and you can still have the product that you want. That at the, in the end, the consumer doesn't think about or care about probably all the other things we've talked about. They want the product, you know, it's, it's palatable, it's a, a pleasing, you know, pleasing to their, if they open the package, it smells right and it looks right and my, my pet loves it. Um, and, and what's Another thing, again, is it being digested and so stool quality is, is maintained really, because that's always a, 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 one of the most important measures. It's not very scientific, but stool quality is always always very important. And if something's not being cooked right uh, or, or it doesn't look right, it's, it's not going to be very, you know, you're not going to be able to sell it because uh, so that definitely has to be an area that's studied, just studied by someone other than me, probably <laughs> in, that, <laughs> in that area. But, but, uh, but that's a very important aspect of it. So it's always important to test your formulations in the processing lab if you can. Exactly. Or, yeah, or, exactly. Work with, or work with your supplier partners to do that. Exactly. And even if you could do a, you know, a simple palatability or just a, a, you know, a lot of people just use their own pets, I think, to do a quick, does it like to eat it? And, you know, um, you know, did everything go okay? But, you know, really to make the food before you even get to an animal, is it, is the food, are the food properties bulk density and, you know, if you're looking at the pore size, is it being from an extrusion perspective? If it's a canned diet, is it is it holding well together? If it's on the human side, of course, it's you, you can quickly see, you know, when you open that package, does it look like I, like I want it to look? You know, it depends on what you're what you're you're doing there. But that's a very important side of it on on the really the applied side that it has to it has to work in reality, not just not on on paper. Right, right. Okay, let's finish up with um, an area I know that you have been researching because the, the question specifically was, has there been any research done to compare human grade protein sources versus byproduct sources? Um, and this is, a, I will confess, this is a bit of a, a teasing self-promotion because Kelly will be presenting research along with a few other researchers on fresh and human grade proteins at Pet Food Forum in September. Um, but you, maybe you can give a little bit of a highlight of, of some of the research that you've done. Sure, sure. Over the last few years, we've we've uh, dealt with both fresh fresh uh, pet foods, but also then human human grade uh, foods as well. And they are different, so some are not human grade, and others are. But uh, all of them, as a category, uh, not surprisingly, probably they're really really palatable, and so um, highly palatable, highly digestible. And so every single one we've we've looked at, really high digestibility. I say that, and, and some people, you know, when some of the, we had a, a paper that came out earlier this year and there was a lot of press around it and others said, well, was there not, not enough fiber? So that were they constipated? If you have it formulated correctly, and a lot of these human grade foods have a lot of fruits and vegetables and you know, whole grains, th there is still uh, enough fiber there, but they are, you know, highly digestible. So when you look at, especially in the rooster study, but, but the dog study and cat studies as well, but the roosters, a lot of these amino acids are, digested at above 90 to in, in the mid 90 percentages, which is just kind of crazy, actually. It's, you know, highly, highly digest, digestible. And so they, they just perform really well. It just, 
they're just different. And so that's where some people say, well, that's not really fair. But so you have to, they're different ingredients. The processing's different. The nutrient content's different, which is true. You have to, you have to remember when you're comparing these diets, all of those factors are important. The ingredients, how they've been processed and handled, the formulation, they, they all dictate that. But certainly, um, so I, I guess I could say, just like you could say for organic or natural or anything, just because it's organic or just because it's human grade doesn't automatically make it you know, a good food, but, but you're, when you're starting with the raw ingredients of that quality, um, most of those, you know, the companies I've worked with, whether on the research or the, 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 uh, the, the consulting side, you know, they have their process in, in place and they've, they've done a lot of that. And they're really, uh, you know, a lot of goal, their, their goal is to, it's that optimal health and optimal experience of the pet. And so they're, they're, they're taking it very seriously. And if you're going to, you know, pay the money to have that grade of ingredient, you have to have it in place, the processing in place to kind of go along with that. So you're not damaging those ingredients. And so in our experience, the, the fresh and the human grade foods really perform well. Um, but again, again, on the raw side, we fed raw years and years ago, again, and we started in the zoos. If you don't have enough fiber there, you will have constipated pets because they're so digestible. And so, uh, but these formulas I've worked with, with the, those natural inclusion of, of, of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, it really, um, it, it is, you know, it's, it's like human food. And so that they've balanced them uh, correctly. And that's where I usually don't do the formulations, but I, I collaborate with the formulators on those. And so I do look at, you know, of course the, the essential nutrients, but fiber technically is not essential, but uh, on, on paper, if you look at AFCO or NRC, but it, it but it is essential if you really want a, a healthy pet and want adequate, you know, laxation and stool quality. And um, so we do look at the fiber quite a bit to make sure it's, it's, it's fine. But so you have highly digestible fats and proteins, but you still have, um, and some starch in there too is, is, is helpful, but you have enough fiber there as well to, to kind of pro provide uh, you know, adequate stool volume and, and laxation. So um, no, they've done very well. Yeah, there'll be more discussion of this. Uh, we have a yeah, panel discussion, some talks at, in September at Pet Food Forum. So um, we'll be presenting some of our data there and then we'll have a couple other speakers too that are kind of, we'll be applying it you know, to, talking about, you know, feeding guidelines and stuff. That's where it gets kind of tricky. And we, we probably are going to run out of time to talk about that. But when they are so digestible, the calculations or estimates of, of energy value and things like that are different. So we have to take that into account. And so you just can't say, put the modified outwater factors on there and it's going to be fine. It, 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 it undervalues, underestimates the, the caloric content quite a bit if you do that. So that's a topic we'll be, I'll be talking about. And the microbiome is another, it could be a, a whole different session as well. To, you know, we could have an hour session, but that's something as well. That if you look at those foods, the microbiome is just very different. They're all the healthy animals, but if you feed, and hardly anyone's looked at canned food, but if you look at kibble, canned, human grade, you know, whatever format you have on the human and fresh, um, the microbiome profile is very, very different in, in healthy animals. And so that's an area that we're heavily researching. And I think it's still, the jury's out on that as well. What is, what is normal? What does healthy look like? It really depends on what you're feeding and what you're eating. And that's on the human side too. I, I work with some people on the human side and um, if you're eating fast food all the time, that's normal for you. It's gonna be very different than if you're, you know, you know, and I say fast food with, you know, not many probably healthy foods. If you have a lot of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and um, you know, it, your, your microbiome profile is gonna be very different. So it, it's the same thing with pets. And so we'll, we'll definitely touch on more of that in, in September. Okay, a lot still to uncover. Well, um, thank you so much. We've, we've uncovered a lot today. Uh, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. But you know, get, again, thank you to Kelly for your insights and expertise. Um, we've mentioned he will be presenting some research at Pet Food Forum, which is back in person um, this year in September and as a conference and exhibition. If you want to learn more about Kelly's session or um, any other thing on the agenda, we have a lot of different topics. We will be discussing sustainability quite a bit. You can see the full agenda at petfoodformevents.com. And there are also early bird registration savings available right now to take advantage of. Um, I'd also like to extend a big thank you again to Dave and OVA Innovations for their support of today's chat. Our next Ask the Pet Food Pro chat will be on July 28th, featuring uh, Dr. Scott Whiteside of Clemson University, as I mentioned, talking about sustainability and pet food packaging. And that chat will be sponsored by Peel Plastics, so thank you to them. And thank you to all of you for participating and logging in. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and your evening. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.